flexibility, convenience, opportunity. Find your digital advantage in the Keeneland Digital Sales Ring. Backed by the most trusted name in thoroughbred sales. Visit KeenelandDigital.com to learn more. Good afternoon, late afternoon. It's 5.08, Tuesday, October 12th. This is the TDN Writers Room presented by Keeneland. Thank God, it's great not to have to do a podcast at the crack of dawn. My name is Joe Bianca. I'm the associate editor of the Thoroughbred Daily News. And just to cut off any Red Sox talk at the past, the real news. Hockey is back tonight, baby. I know you're Oh, good up. Lord. Who, who cares? Uh, yeah. I'm Bill Finley, a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. The Boston Red Sox go into the season. Nobody, myself included, gives them a prayer. They are now four wins away from going to the World Series after beating the Tampa Bay Rays. It's a beautiful thing. Jonathan Green, general manager of DJ Stable, and the reports of my demise were greatly exaggerated. Not that greatly. Oh, we're glad you're back, man. I'm glad you're feeling better. And yeah, John's been on the sidelines for a little bit, as you can tell by his beard. Um, but we're, we're glad to have him back. And yeah, what a scrappy underdog story. The Red Sox, who have won like 12 titles in the last 20 <laughs> years. Yeah, who could have ever seen that coming? But congratulations. Uh, I guess. Just, you're just jealous, Joe. I, I don't like cheaters. Exactly. That's my, my strong feeling. And, and that's going to be the theme of the show today, apparently, is, is <laughs> our, our cheaters. It's going, be, it's going to be the Red Sox and a couple of trainers that are coming up on to, you know, again, law and order. Why play by the rules ever? Exactly. Exactly. One thing, though, before we get any further, it is, you know, you mentioned that the facial hair and I didn't realize it was coming in so gray, but it almost looks like like, Joe, you're the ghost of Christmas present. I'm the ghost of Christmas future, and Bill's just the Grim Reaper. <laughs> Coming back firing. I love it. We missed you, man. Thanks. I, I believe me, I was missed. I, I definitely, listen, it, it, if we can take a serious turn on, 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 on the show for once, you know, I was vaccinated, and, and this COVID bug is as debilitating as, as can be. I mean, even, even when I was at the hospital and, and trying to get, you know, um, medication procedures and stuff like that. Just the stories and, and the people that you would see who were there, um, vaccinated and unvaccinated. And unfortunately, some of them will never make it out of the hospital. And I mean, it's just that this Delta variant in particular, um, you know, is, is just so debilitating and deadly. Um, so if you haven't gotten vaccinated and, and you're not sure about it, um, I can tell you that I, if, if I wasn't vaccinated, I probably would not be of this earth anymore. I mean, I, I, I got honest, believe that I was out for two full weeks, even with the vaccine. And I know I'm kind of wimpy when it comes to being sick, but there were definitely nights where I closed my eyes and, and thought, you know what, this may not happen. Like I may not get up again. And, and it was that bad. Man. That, that's horrifying. Uh, we're, we're glad we're glad you're still with us, obviously. Yeah, it's 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 no joke. Um, I, I feel like it's been kind of downplayed by a lot of people. But, you know, if you've been through it, you know, you know how real that is. And we're glad that John is on the mend and we hope he keeps getting better. Yep. Thanks, guys. Thanks for all your support, too. I, I appreciate it. I got some very nice emails and texts and and direct messages um, over the past couple of weeks. And I, I really appreciate that. There were some really funny names also that came through for our naming contest. We'll get into later, um, which which I thought were cute. There were a couple of them that weren't so cute, like like, you know, R.I.P. John and poke the body um, and Joe and Bill are great, which normally I wouldn't I would agree with. But it was my mom who put that last one in. My mom actually put Joe and Bill are great as a name. It is under 18 letters and spaces. So technically it could fit. Um, but uh, surprisingly, it hasn't been taken yet. That was the big surprise. But but yeah, I, I do really appreciate all the the, the kind thoughts and, and prayers and, and everything. And, and keep sending them out to other people who, who are on the mend because they definitely need it. But using using the glasses for the for the sponsor reads today. I want I want to class it up a little bit. I want I want to make it a little bit more. Yeah, exactly. I want I want to make it a little bit more professional and, and more bookish. You know, as, as we get as we get through, and then we have a new sponsor to announce later in the show that we're very excited about. But the TDN Writers Room is presented by Keeneland. The Keeneland Fall Meet, which was super exciting opening weekend. We're going to get to Fall Stars Weekend. There was a lot of action. Keeneland Fall Meet continues through October 30th. Uh, new Keeneland Select accounts receive a special $100 back after you wager $200 on Keeneland Racing this fall. Wager a total of $300 in the first 30 days and earn another 
$100 back as if you need another incentive to bet the outstanding racing that's at Keeneland. You can visit KeenelandSelect.com to sign up. All right, so the big the big action over the weekend was at Keeneland. We had a couple of things at Belmont that I want to mention, but you know the real headliner of the weekend, as it, she's kind of always the headliner when she runs, was Latruska in the Judd Monspinster Stakes. She has just put together a really remarkable season, and she took one step closer to a potential horse of the year title on, on Sunday. And, and did she look good? I know that she didn't win by a lot. She only won by like a length and a half. She got a 101 buyer, which isn't anything groundbreaking. But she just she was moving so well, basically had her ears pricked the whole way around. You know, I just she's a real joy to watch. And it's it's a credit to Fausto Gutierrez that he's been able to keep her at this level through a long campaign. Because if you remember, she ran last December in the Rampart Stakes at Gulfstream and won by like six and three quarter lengths or something. And then came back in January and won the Houston Ladies Classic. Then she ran the Azari. Then she ran the Apple Blossom. Then she ran in the, the Octon Phipps. Then the Florida Lee, then the personal ends in, and now the Spinster, and now she's going to run in the Breeders' Cup distaff. You know, Bill, this is Bill's hobby horse, but you don't see horses like this, who, you know, at least especially top level horses who just run and run and run throughout the year and maintain that top form. So she is an absolute joy to watch. Um, you know, I, she's, I, is she the fastest, most brilliant distaffer, star mare we've ever seen? No, but she beats everybody that's in front of her. And, you know, the discussion now becomes whether or not she should run the distaff or in the classic. She needs to run in the distaff. I'm sorry. If they want to win horse of the year, she needs to run in the distaff. And I know it's not, you know, I, I'm usually in, in favor of, of stepping outside the box and taking on the boys. She will get drowned in that Breeders' Cup classic. That's not a that's not an insult to her. She's terrific. It's just that this year is a particularly strong Breeders' Cup classic field with a lot of other speed in it. And I think that 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 will not bode well for her. So in, in terms of getting the horse of the year trophy, she should run in the distaff. I think she'll be a heavy favorite. I think she'll win. And that if she does, that'll make seven graded stakes wins on the year, five grade ones. And she's obviously uh, she's undefeated. Or did she lose in the Azari? She might have yeah, one she loss. Yeah, she lost in the Azari. Yeah, so she has one loss. Regardless, like that, you know, one loss in, in seven or eight races is a pretty damn good campaign. But uh, what did you guys think of Latruska? Yeah, I mean, Joe, you're absolutely spot on on this. She's remarkable. And I love the way she's been campaigned. It's almost an old school thing. And I think the fact that uh, the trainer is basically a guy based in Mexico. He's only has a few horses in the United States. Um, I don't think he, he hasn't drank the Kool-Aid. The can only run four times a year, have to have six weeks off in between all the races. So the campaign she's had is, is absolutely remarkable. And, you know, she is. She's fun to watch. She's really good. She's easy to pull for. But I, I would disagree with you on this one point that if she wins, if she goes in the gist app, which she's going to, I think that actually hurts her chances to be horse of the year because the only way she's going to be horse of the year if she wins the gist app is if, uh, you know, someone like Maxfield or a 12 to one shot wins the Breeders' Cup Classic. If it's go, essential quality, maybe Hot Rod Charlie, any of the main contenders win the Breeders' Cup Classic, they will be horse of the year and not Latruska. So I see you shaking your head about that, but I. He is going to win horse of the year if he wins the Classic. That? Hot Rod Charlie is going to win Horse of the Year if he wins the Classic. I don't uh, think it's so. possible. Yeah, it's possible. So, okay, but next, let's take player, let's take Essential Quality player. and Nick's. Let's take Essential Quality and Nick's go. They definitely would. And there's some other there's some other players in there. And I I'm the one you right. She probably lose the Classic, but I'm the one that I, I want to see someone go for it. I want to see someone just throw convention to the wind and say, you know, I've got a great horse. I'm going to go out and prove it. You know, pull a Kenny McPeak here. And say, you know, we're going to do this because it's like really challenging and we're great sports. But, you know, it, it's obviously not going to happen. She'll likely win the distaff and, and we'll see what happens there. Um, but, you know, what? no matter what she does, uh, even if she were, were, were to win the Breeders' Cup distaff, which probably that's not going to happen. You can't say enough good things about her. I love the fact that that she's old school. She's run, you know, at seven different racetracks this year. She's won. Um, you know, five in a row, four of them are grade ones and a, and a grade two. Um, and she's the kind of filly you root for because she basically goes to the front and says, come catch me. 
And nobody can. Nobody in that division has been able to come close, you know, save the one race where she ran second, um, you know, in the Azari and just lost in, in a photo. But as far as the, 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 the hype of should she run in the classic or the distaff, it, it doesn't matter what we think. It matters what the connections think. And basically, the connections have already said, we're going to run her in the distaff. And, you know, guys, don't forget, it's not like the distaff is a half a million dollar race. I mean, it's a, a couple of million dollars that she's going to be able to, to run for and ultimately you know, win. And, and the thing that, that hurts me is that, you know, I would love to see her run in the classic also as a fan. But she would be, you know, she'd be like fourth or fifth choice in that race. And as opposed to running in the distaff and, and being the, you know, the, the, the three to five favorite. Um, and, and probably if she wins the distaff, that pretty much, you know, eradicates any chances that Gamin is going to be, you know, the distaff <laughs> horse of the year. So, yeah. you know, for me, it's a double, it really is a double whammy in that sense. Hey, John, yeah. I just want to bring something up, though. And this is another point. This horse is not owned by an ordinary rich guy. He's not owned by a mere millionaire who might care about winning a purse in the Breeders' Cup uh, distaff. And if, you know, if you're strictly going for the money, yeah, the Breeders' Cup distaff makes sense. This guy, you know, he's kind of a, a guy in the shadows a little bit, you know, for obvious reasons. He is not out in public. But, you know, it's reported he's the second richest man in Mexico and is a billionaire with a B. So, I mean, I couldn't imagine that he cares one bit about what money she earns in the Breeders' Cup, if it's the whatever bout she would win versus the distaff versus the, the classic or, or whatsoever. I mean, you know, I can't even fathom somebody like that, how much money he must have. So I think the money is actually a good point in this in this instance. Well, how about, you know, how about he bought her dam with her in utero for $100,000 at Keelan November? in 2015 like that that is pretty remarkable what he's been able to turn that mare into you know i again i i agree with you guys that it'd be nice to see her take on the boys and then step out of her comfort zone but i just think in this particular year that race does not shape up well for her at all and if she, if she runs up the track if she runs sixth or seventh beating you know 15 lengths that's going to take all the bloom off the rose in terms of her getting horse of the year i think it makes sense to go in the distaff but just look at her record overall she's now 17 for 22 in her career and you just don't see horses like that you know horses at, at her caliber let her alone stick around to run 22 times and then win 17 of those races. She's just, she's an absolute pleasure to watch. And, and like I said, an incredible, incredible training job this year by, with her, uh, by Fausto Gutierrez. Just wanted to mention a couple other races from the weekend. Cause it wasn't just her. Uh, it was a huge weekend at Kimo and had a bunch of grade ones, a couple interesting performances at Belmont Two I want, I want to mention in particular uh, in love winning the, the Kimo turf mile. I want to give it a shout out to Paolo Lobo. Cause this is a guy who, Back in the day, not even back in the day, like 10, 15 years ago, had a lot of top level horses. I think back to him having Pico Central, who I was a big fan of. And then he kind of fell back a little bit. He came, he, you know, he, he stepped back into the shadows, didn't have a lot of great horses. But now he's got a couple of good ones. And look at what he's done with them. He won the, the Keeneland Turf Mile for the second straight year with two different horses. He won it with Ivar last year. He was also fourth on Saturday in the Keeneland Turf Mile and de defending his, uh, his title. In Love is a nice horse, too. You know, not super well-bred by Agnes Gold, who's a, you know, kind of little-known Japanese-bred sire. Uh, big first big win, first grade one win for the for the jockey, Alex Ashard. So congratulations to him. And I just, I like seeing the, these kind of lower profile connections jumping up and winning these grade one races. And Paolo Lobo is a guy who can definitely train. And I think people might've forgotten that a little bit because he didn't have the top stock in the last decade or so, but he's going to have two good shots in the mile. And I'm looking forward to that. The other horse I wanted to mention, cause this was, this was an interesting race, even though it was a short field was in the Vosburg on Saturday at Belmont was following C a following C was a horse that I really, really liked earlier in the year. If you remember, he was the, he was one of the horses that Spendthrift transferred from Bob Baffert to Todd Pletcher and really came out firing for Todd Pletcher, had this dominant allowance, optional claiming win. And then they, they kind of, you know, they took the bait then they went for that grade one going two turns, never seemed like a horse who wanted to go that far. He was maybe the worst second you'll ever see in the Haskell. Mm -hmm. He was, he was beaten 15 and a half lengths and got put up 
via DQ because of Hot Rod Charlie. That's maybe the, the worst, like most, you know, nondescript second you'll ever see in a grade one. And then I was kind of disappointed with how he ran in the H. Allen Jerkins. Like, I know that, you know, no one was really going to mess with life is good. And Jackie's were that day. They were both just so brilliant. But I thought, you know, I, th- I thought he should have been a little bit closer to them. So it was great to see him come back and doing what he wants to do, running six furlongs in the Bosberg. It was a very comprehensive win. Uh, Baby Yoda, John's favorite horse to do an impression of, unfortunately did not run that well. That was like the first step back he took. He was, he was, what he was well beaten in there. Um, but to dust forensic fire like that, who is a, he's a Belmont terror um, in the Vosburgh, I thought was, was really nice. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing what he does, what he does the rest of the year. And then maybe we'll see, we'll get to see him as, as a four-year-old as well. Just a couple other two-year-old performances. Um, Liam's map had another great one winner with Juju's map in the Alcibiades. She was pretty impressive. Uh, Rattle and roll. I thought looked very good in the Claiborne Breeders Futurity. A lot of races this weekend that didn't necessarily get huge figures, but I thought were very visually impressive. Rattle and roll only got an 81 um, for winning the Breeders Futurity, but I thought visually looked very, very good. And I thought on paper that looked like a pretty good field. Um, and then Tis the Bomb on Sunday in the Bourbon Stakes on the turf at Keeneland broke through the gate and ran off for like a furlong or so. And that's usually the kiss of death. You almost never see horses do that and then run well, let alone win. He got back in the gate, broke great, got a good position, and ended up winning that race. So Ken McPeak had a, had a big weekend, you know, after the the summer that he had with you know the equine herpes um, quarantine, not getting to run Swiss Skydiver in the shoe view like he wanted. I thought it was nice to see him get those two big wins over the weekend. He's probably going to be pretty loaded for the Breeders' Cup in terms of two year olds. Anything else you guys want to touch on from the weekend's races beyond Latruska? Joe, a couple other observations from the weekend, and from a gambling perspective. When do you ever see Chad Brown in a grade one race in New York, the Joe Hurst Classic? How about this? Runs first and second in there, and the exact pays $178. Now, that's completely red for you because I didn't like any of those horses in there. And then um, also, he wins the uh, race at Keeneland, the first lady, blood, first and second in there, and first lady winner paid twelve dollars and sixty cents. So a rare opportunity to gamblers could actually make some money betting on Chad Brown, who usually in these turf races is four to five. Uh, the other thing I noticed over the weekend was the very poor performance of the European horses. Uh, we talked about it on the show uh, at nauseum about how much they were just killing it here in the US between Aiden O'Brien and Charlie Appleby. They were winning everything in sight. This weekend, they absolutely laid an egg. Uh, Japan was, uh, uh, I believe, fourth or sixth in the Joe Hurst Turf Classic. Um, the um, Althika came back at a first start after winning those two grade ones in New York, was fourth at Keeneland. And then um, on top of that, Order of Australia, the winner of last year's Breeders' Cup Mile, last in the Keeneland Mile this weekend. So, you know, just when I had decided that the Europeans are going to wipe the floor with the American horses in the Breeders' Cup, what do you do now? Yeah, and you guys bring up some excellent points. There were a couple other, um, you know, wow moments for me this weekend when I was watching the races. Um, number one was Golden Pal. And Golden Pal coming back. And, you know, if you remember last year, he won the, the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint. Uh, and then they uh, this year, you know, he won the Quick Call. They brought him over to York and he laid an egg there. And then he they brought him back and, and won at Keeneland, the grade two, very impressively. Um, and is rounding into form at the right time. And there's a horse that you have to root for. I mean, he's really, really well bred. Uh, you know, he's bred to, to sprint. He's bred to, you know, to run on the turf or the dirt, but he prefers the turf. And uh, it's good to see him rounding in the form for Wesley Ward and, and the Magners and, and, and that camp. Uh, the other thing is from a trainer perspective, and when you mentioned some of the accolades that, that Chad Brown had this weekend, he had a phenomenal weekend, but how about my man, Mark Cassie, who won 10 races this weekend at Woodbine, 10 of them, including two graded stake races. Um, the man is on fire up there. He's, he's dominating up there. And, you know, one of the things that we talk about on the show all the time is, Hey, if something's not working, why aren't people changing things? And I can give you just a, a quick kind of microcosm of that. We bought a filly named Art of Almost in January at the Keeneland uh, sale and sponsor Keeneland. And, uh, and, you know, and, and it wasn't that she was inexpensive, but we bought her more as a broodmare prospect for 290000 And we said, you know what? She's, she's in good form. Um, you know, she's a little underweight. Let's go ahead and kind of tweak her and work on her a little bit. And, and she's a five-year-old. So, you know, she's obviously she's just run 20-something times and, you know, was multiple graded stakes placed. Well, Cassie took her and said, you know what? 
I can put some weight on her. I know she's not eating. Um, they did a, an ultra scan and, and basically she had ulcers. And uh, so we worked on, on some you know, different diet for her, different training regimen, make her a little bit happier. Anyway, long story short, we ran her a couple of times and then brought her to Woodbine. And Mark and I were talking and we said, look, she just may have lost the interest in racing. It's not exciting for her. She kind of runs and then, and then stops and kind of just phones it in at that point. Um, so we decided at that point to throw a set of blinkers on, which for a five-year-old, you normally don't do. But I tip my cap to the Hall of Fame trainer, Mark Cassie, on this one. We put blinkers on her and she's won two of her last three races, including a grade three and may have just squeezed the lemon and gotten the last bit of juice out of her. Cause now she's a grade three winner and she's made, you know, close to $370,000. So, you know, sometimes the, you can teach an old dog new tricks. Yeah. Well, that's what we bank on every week with you, John. We try to teach you new tricks all the can we time. We give a shout out as well to Jeff Ronco winning seven of the nine races on the West Virginia Breeders' Cup Classic Card, and uh, what Boca Chica winning eight out of nine. I know it's not at Belmont, Keeneland, or Saratoga or something like that. That was really a phenomenal achievement for those guys. It, it doesn't matter. Even if you're in a, if you're yeah. a two-person race, if you win yeah. that many times, you're dominating. You're, you're, you're in the zone, no question. Bill is, is locked in to racing <laughs> all across America. That's, that's why he gets paid the big bucks. The yeah. Fire Park and the Charlestown coverage. No <laughs> one else can do, but only Bill brings you that that kind of across That's the right. country coverage. So we appreciate that. Um, and also just wanted to follow up. I, I thought Auto Australia was terribly overbet in that race. I think the Euros, I think the, like Bill was saying, the reputation of the Euros being so good this year made people overbet them a little bit. I thought I'll keep, I'll think it was overbet as well. And I want to agree with John on Golden Pal, you know, he didn't get a great speed figure. He's been more brilliant before, but I really liked him the way he fought back in that race after being passed by fire crow and just dusted him after, you know, it's not, not easy to get collared at the eighth pole and then win by open lines. Like that's, that's not really an easy thing to do. And, and so I like the, the kind of the guts that he showed uh, in, in that race as well. And, and you got to think he's going to be among the favorites for the, for the turf sprint coming up. Yeah. And Joe, you know, that that's why it was so surprising to me that the Euros didn't run as well, because that Keeneland turf cut for this week, especially, um, was a really thick cut and it was more European-esque and certainly not, you know, not what our speed favoring, you know, sprinters like to have. That's why Golden Powell was so impressive to me was that just as you mentioned, he got passed and you said, that's it, he's done. And yet he came back on a tiring turf course and, and, and finished up strong. So, um, you know, excellent point on your part. After wrapping up an exciting Fall Stars weekend, there's more stakes action to look forward to this weekend at Keelan with the Great Three Buffalo Trace Franklin County Stakes on Friday. I wanted to mention that, actually. We might get to it in the weekend preview later. Campanell was another very exciting Wesley Ward horse that went over to Europe and is now coming back to, to run and, and maybe potentially springboard from that in the Breeders' Cup. So you got that to look forward to. And then the QE2 on Saturday, which is always a really nice race late in the season, one of the last you know uh, opportunities for three-year-old fillies to run in you know, exclusive three-year-old Philly company on the turf. So that's always one to look forward to. And also the Keeneland November breeding stock sale catalog is available. Book one is going to begin Wednesday, November 10th. The sale will continue through November 19th. Um, I'm not sure if John's looked at the, at the catalog at all so far. Joe, the Keeneland November sale has been a destination spot for us for years, uh, not only on the buying side, but also on the selling side. And actually this year we're selling um, seven horses with, uh, with TaylorMade as well as we have another seven or eight horses in the horses of racing age sale. And the reason why we put some horses in the horses of racing age sale isn't because, you know, they're at the end of their, their careers, um, but rather we're trying to monetize them and, and ultimately have people, you know, continue on with, with some of those horses, including like proven strategy who, you know, who, who, you know, ran a, won a great two for us and, and is now, uh, you know, a little bit older, but still um, ran second in a, in a great two this summer at, at Monmouth park. So we love this sale. It's been a destination site for us. Now that I'm feeling healthy enough, I'm, I'm sure that I'm going to be down there, um, you know, looking at some of some broodmares, looking at some weanlings. Um, I'm really anxious to see some first year sires, you know, with, with their full crop and, and the weanlings and see how they look. And to me, this is the sale you have to be at if you're going to be buying racehorses of the horses of racing age day, which is a dedicated day now. Um, and also it's really imperative for your breeding operation to be down there for the November sale, because that's where all the deals are made there. I can tell you that 90% of our mating contracts get done that those first couple of days of the Keeneland November sale, because everybody is there and everyone is anxious to get deals done. 
Yeah, and it's right off the hill of the Breeders' Cup, so there's a lot of excitement still buzzing from that. And also, like I mentioned before, uh, Latruska's dam was bought with her in utero for just $100,000 at Keeneland November. So not only can you buy potential superstar mares, but maybe superstars within the mares too. So I, the possibilities are endless. And we'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. couldn't compose a better pedigree. A half-brother to Beholder. Beholder's gonna go all the way! A half-brother to Into Mischief. Into Mischief wins the Kef Core Futurity! The most versatile performer from this brilliant family. Mendelssohn's gonna do it! Mendelssohn has won it by a length! What a win by Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn by a conservative 17 lengths. Scat Daddy's best bred son at stud. Mendelssohn. So we could not be more excited to announce and welcome a new sponsor to the show, Coolmore. Coolmore decided to sponsor this humble little show. I don't know what we're doing so right, but we want to thank Coolmore for coming aboard. Listen, they, they, they kind of don't need any introduction. Like that's that's the kind of operation that does not need an introduction. You all see that. You all see their their horses across the globe, winning grade ones and group ones all the time. You see their stallion footprint across the globe as well. So we are super, super thankful for Coolmore to come aboard. And we really, really appreciate everybody there for supporting the show. And, and yeah, I could not be more excited. You know, John's got a little bit of, of personal tidbits uh, about his, his relationship with Coolmore. But I just wanted to mention some of the stuff that they've got going on. It's a really exciting time. An Ashford stud uh, with first crop yearling sires like Justify. Again, needs no introduction. And Mendelssohn as well. Uh, just recently, Mendelssohn sired the sale topper at the facing tip and fall mid Atlantic's yearling sale, $235,000 cult out of grace's gun, which is a great Dave Matthews band song already this year. His yearlings have sold up to $900,000. Of course, triple crown winner justify has had success around the globe. He was the talk of the town at, at Keeneland September as he should be um, as he leads his crop of first crop yearling sires with an average yearling price of nearly $400,000. So obviously everybody's reacting to him as well as you would think, if not better. Uh, also, First crop two-year-old sire Cupid had an exciting weekend. He had a stakes double, so two stakes winners over the weekend. The sky is falling. Uh, it was the first winner for the Son of Tappet, first stakes winner for the Son of Tappet in the West Virginia Triple Crown New Patrician Breeders Class stakes. I got all that out in, in, in one shot. Um, and then less than 24 hours later, God of Love took the cup and saucer stakes at Woodbine for Mark Cassie. John mentioned Mark Cassie's success over the weekend. Um, Eclipse Thoroughbred Partners and Gary Barber were also partners on, on that horse. Um, and also future Coolmore cool sire Golden Powell, who we mentioned in the in the weekend recap. He won last year's Breeders' Cup Juvenile Turf Sprint, obviously, and added a fourth stakes win to his resume this weekend, um, taking the grade two Woodford stakes to Keeneland, as I mentioned. Really showed a lot of guts. He's already showed his brilliance, but showed a lot of guts getting past in that race and coming back to re-break and win. And we're all looking forward to seeing him in the Breeders' Cup. But John, what, what was your experience at Goff so uh, with the Coolmore boys and, and, you know, buying some mental sense, I think. Yeah. You know, it was really amazing. I, I, I unfortunately was only at the Goff sale for, for literally like 40 hours and then, and then flew home um, because I wasn't feeling well, but I have to tell you that during that window of time, um, you know, so many people came up to me and, and talked about the show and talked about just, you know, how much they enjoy hearing from it. And they said we have funny accents, but I don't really hear that. Um, but for, for the most part, you know, it was really, really nice. I had a, a very nice um, conversation with with MV Magner, um, who was just a gentleman, just absolutely a gentleman. And um, the very first thing he said to me is just how much he enjoys listening to the show and the fact that, you know, we breathe life into some of these stories that that are that are behind the scenes. And 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 for somebody of his stature and magnitude in the industry to, to take the time to say how much he appreciates the show really, really meant a lot to me. Um, now, from a from another personal standpoint, you know, we went there trying to find some some well-bred fillies and we were fortunate enough to buy six fillies at that sale. And five of them, five of them are daughters of Coolmore Stallion, um, Churchill, No Nay Never, Mendelssohn, uh, U.S. Navy flag and Caravaggio. And, and Joe and Bill, ironically enough, I had to fly across the ocean 
to Ireland to be able to buy a Mendelssohn because we were getting so outbid for all the Mendes that were here. It was it was really astonishing. Um, and then at the very end of the sale, um, I was really pleased because Niall Brennan, who's a, a close personal friend of ours and we've worked with for years and years, um, we were on the on the plane on the way home and uh, he had gotten a text saying that he was able he was successfully in purchasing a Justify Philly. And it was one that was on our list as well. So I actually am personally investing in a Justify Philly to pinhook with Niall Brennan. It's a hip 415 Justify out of Costa del Sol, um, who was just a really outstanding Philly. So again, we had to fly all the way to Ireland to be able to get a Justify Philly um, because they were just such demand here in the States. So um, kudos to, to Coolmore um, and Ashford for not only having the right kind of stallions, but promoting you know their yearlings and, and their falls. Um, and uh, again, like you said, they don't need us to, to, to uh, you know, as a springboard to put their name out there. Um, but we really appreciate the fact that they're sponsoring the show. And uh, I couldn't be prouder personally to be able to talk about their stallions and their program because we've been breeding to them, to their studs and, and utilizing their stallions for years and years and years. Um, and uh, this is just a really exciting day for me as well. Yeah, and just a really, really second to none breeding and racing operation on a global scale. You mentioned some of the sires, Mendelssohn, Justify, Caravaggio, who we haven't really spoken that much about because he doesn't have that many runners in the U.S. yet, but he's off to a great start as well. He's got double digit winners. He's, yeah, he was a brilliant, beautiful horse to watch. And it looks like he's going to be a, a terrific stallion as well, son of Scat Daddy. We, you know, we're, there aren't too many of those. So he's, he's, he's very exciting. And yeah, I got a second what John said here in that MV Magner watches the show i mean that's that was that was very flattering and, and we appreciate his support and everybody at coolmore support so welcome aboard to the tdn writers room express we appreciate it to everybody at coolmore all right so john we we had, we had to say goodbye to john he's already he's still recovering he really just he wanted to come back for for a segment or two and, and just kind of get his feet wet again so we're happy that he's feeling better and we hope that he's back to 100 percent next week because you know the show isn't, isn't the same without him but it's just going to be me and bill taking you the rest of the way uh, this is a story that actually was just published in the TDN about an hour and a half ago. So Bill hasn't really had a chance to read it. I'm kind of asking him to do a, a real time reaction, but it's by Dan Ross, who I think for my money covers California racing the best out of anybody in the industry. And I'm not just saying that because he works for TDN. Um, he, he does a lot of these kind of broad scope, uh, you know, very immersive discussions and, and questions and, and investigative reports on California racing. And one of them um, is a potential, uh, act well, it's not potential. It is an October 19th CHRB committee agenda item, which is quote, discussion regarding the advisability of penalizing trainers for injuries and fatalities for horses in their care. Um, emphasis on the word discussion. It's very early in a complicated process. This is an interesting thing. Um, and you should go read the story because there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of people who could be held responsible for when horses get injured on the racetrack. I first off, before I want to get in, before I get into any of that, I, I just got to say that I think California has done a very, very good job in the last two years of being proactive from when they had that, that rash of breakdowns that obviously was very disastrous for the industry and got in the news uh, so much and, and really made the industry look bad. You know, you can say what you want about them, maybe kind of looking the other way on the Baffert stuff over the years, but they have, I think they really stepped up to the plate and have, have instituted a lot of reforms that have made, you know, tangible differences. There was a 50% decline in fatalities last year in California, which is a huge number and not easy to, to accomplish. Delmar has a great safety record. Santa Anita has an, you know, an improving safety record, but this is an interesting thing because this is not, a, this is not a, like a, a reform that everybody will necessarily get behind. The trainers obviously have a reason to be against this because if a horse breaks down, you know, either when it's racing or when it's training, you can't necessarily point the finger and say that their trainer was, you know, negligent or incompetent or was, you know, wasn't looking out for the best interests of the horse. Now, if you have a lot of them, if you have a string of them over time and then you can establish a pattern, then I think you can take it in a different direction and start to penalize trainers for that kind of stuff. It's just when it's when it's these one offs or it's like a, a couple in a short period of time, I think that makes it tough. So there's going to be a lot of pushback from the trainers at this meeting. 
you know, when it, when it comes to the CHRB discussing this and I give the CHRB credit for, for, you know, requesting input from the trainers and, and solicit, soliciting their expertise, because it's, it's something that they really should have a lot of input in, but they also, I think should not have a total, they shouldn't be totally closed off to this either, because at the end of the day, if your horses are not breaking down as frequently as others, and they are, th- those trainers are then kind of sullying the reputation of the entire training colony at your track or in your state, I mean, I think that you have an incentive and a reason to kind of want that behavior and, and to, to stop as, as much as it can possibly be stopped. It's a, it's a very complicated thing. You know, like I said, you know, you know, vets have input when it comes to putting horses on the track that maybe shouldn't be there. You know, there's, he talks, Dan Ross talks in a story about exercise riders who maybe are ignoring issues that they, they shouldn't ignore when it comes to horses on the track that may be in distress, but it's a very interesting thing. And I think it speaks well to the CHRB in California who have been very reform oriented in the last couple of years. And I think that this is the latest step to that. Bill, it's a complicated thought, complicated thoughts, complicated process, but what, what do you feel? Yeah. And, and as you mentioned, I haven't even had a chance to read the story yet, but on the surface and from what you said, I think this makes perfect sense. Now, the problem with this is going to be though, how do you discern between bad luck and negligence? And you know, any trainer, all trainers are going to have horses break down and some may break down horses when they did absolutely nothing wrong. They were just absolutely unlucky. So I, I'm sure that, you know, the bar has to be set in the right place there. And I'm sure the CHRB will, will do that. Um, so if you have a repeat pattern and if, you know, the, your breakdown rate over time is four times higher than the average. Yeah. I mean, somebody should, should do something about that because I, I think when you, you know, when the statistics jump off the page like that, it's not bad luck. It is negligence. And, you know, essentially this is what, um, Santa Anita and the Stornick group already did with Jerry, uh, Jerry Hollendorf. Uh, you know, they looked at his record and they were under a lot of pressure at the time with, with everything that's going on and said, you know, we're not comfortable with you racing here because your breakdown rate is, is so high. And, you know, I don't want to name names because I don't have the list and actual numbers in front of me, but there are some, uh, what I've seen in the past and what I recall, there are some pretty high profile California trainers who have really not good numbers in this category. So, you know, what will happen from here? Well, at the very least, maybe this is a wake up call and guys who might have been taking chances or pushing the envelope will not do it now because it could mean not just the catastrophe and the, the tragedy of a horse breaking down, but it could do something to, to uh, you know, negatively impact their career. So, uh, yeah, I, I think it's a great idea and it'll be really interesting how this works going forward. Yeah. And well, and I think that this has come from, I, I think, the feeling that, you know, when, when horses start breaking down, kind of everybody gets held responsible in general in the industry. And we kind of all have egg on our faces and have to explain ourselves and, and defend ourselves. But the the trainers never really face any repercussions. Now, you mentioned Jerry Hollendorf, right? I would say that he is the exception to the rule. And you mentioned that there are a lot of, you know, high profile trainers in California, including Bob Baffert, John Sadler, a couple of guys who do who do have you know rates that are much higher than the average California trainer and it has not impacted their business in any way and I think that that's kind of where they're coming from here that you know the buck has stopped with everybody else except for the people who are in charge mainly of the horse's care you know the absolute insurer thing so I, th- I think that that comes from a good place and I think also you know the reason that people should be receptive to this is that it's not it's not trying to scapegoat the trainers it's not trying to dump everything in their lap it's part of a of a of a whole reform process that California has really undertaken in the last couple of years when it comes to track safety you know when it comes to veterinary care I think that you know as as long as this is just one plank of the of the uh, the effort and the thrust to make racing safer in California, I think it has to be considered and it has to be, you know, taken with good faith by the training colony. Now, obviously they, they, they need to have input. They need to have a debate you know, about this at the CHRB meeting. And I'm really interested to see what, what happens there and, and kind of what their arguments are and what the counter arguments may be. But again, I think the the big, the big takeaway from this is that this is not trying to scapegoat trainers. It's just trying to hold them responsible in addition to everybody else 
in the industry and in California when there is a rash of breakdowns. And I, I think that, that that's a good thing because up until now, other than Jerry Holland, Arthur, there really hasn't been any particular spotlight on trainers who have a lot of horses break down. And I, I think that they need a little bit of that accountability. The TDN Riders Room is brought to you by Legacy Bloodstock. If you think that 50 years combined experience in the horse business could benefit your program, give Tommy or Wendy a call. They personally advise on each horse as if they were their own. Great weekend for Legacy with graduates from their Facing Tiffany Kentucky October yearling sale consignment. Uh, graduate Shad Nation uh, was an impressive debut winner on Saturday at Belmont Park for, uh, for Christophe Clement, son of Cairo Prince, was purchased by Liz Crow, very, very sharp bloodstock agent at last year's Facing Tiffany Kentucky October. October yearling sale. As I said, another legacy facing tip in October grad, Holy Justice, got her second straight stakes win last week in the Miss Indiana stakes. You can view Legacy's consignment for this year's facing October yearling sale at LegacyBloodstockLLC.com. We'll be right back after this message from Legacy Bloodstock. Being a small family business, I guess we're part of a dying breed. We're really grateful for the people that entrust us. We know it's a huge responsibility. We're always with your horse every step of the way. When it comes to being at the sales ground, showing your horses, we are with your horse. Just driving up and down the road every day, there's not a time that I don't look out and feel a responsibility to the sport, the animal, the people that come to invest in the game. I wanna see as many people enjoy this sport as they possibly can, because we do have the most beautiful sport in the world. Owning potential future superstars like Flightline is attainable with a racing partnership with West Point Thoroughbreds. Partnerships enable you to spread your ownership across several horses for less than it costs to own one horse alone. This increases your racetrack action and your chances for a big horse. Learn more about why West Point Thoroughbreds is the gold standard in racing partnerships at westpointtv.com. West Point had an outstanding weekend across the country. They had a record five wins on Saturday with SWOT analysis at Woodbine. Phantom Smoke and Voodoo Zip at Belmont, Giant Game at Keeneland, and England's Rose in the Springtime Stakes at Santa Anita. They also had Cavalry Charge take an allowance race at Keeneland on Friday, so it's obviously a very exciting time to be involved with West Point, and that's not even getting to all the splashes that they made like at the Keeneland September sale. You know, just to have six wins in, in one weekend is just an incredible accomplishment, so they just keep on rolling. Congratulations to all the partners who were involved with those horses. And I was also just announced at Galilean, who we mentioned last week, multiple Stakes winner by Uncle Mo uh, will be retiring to Hidden Lake Farm in New York for the 2022 breeding season. I believe he has a $7,000 stands and nurses fee. Um, so obviously had a very nice career. And, you know, really, I always like to see those those horses by those top sires added to the New York breeding landscape. I think that that really helps the program overall. So great, great, great career for Gal Lane. And congratulations to the partners for getting him to stand in New York. We'll, we'll look forward to seeing his foals in the future. This story broke last Friday. Uh, Gulfstream Park Steward suspended jockey Carlos Lugo for 30 calendar days. Um, it wasn't for dangerous riding or anything. It was kind of the more more intriguing, a little bit more, more seedier uh, reasons for getting suspended. Uh, he they failed. They, they suspended him for failure to persevere uh, with a horse in the fourth race on October 3rd at Gulfstream. Um, it was a horse that ended up running fourth. Uh, I guess they said he, he didn't really try to get the horse in a trifecta, but the corresponding, you know, evidence that I think led them to this suspension is that there was a lot of, there was suspicious wagering in the race, uh, in the exacta pools and trifecta pools, which were much bigger than the exacta and tri tri trifecta pools for any other race on that day's card. And also the, the, uh, the same trainer trained the winner who was bet from like 15 to one down to five to two and one off, uh, same trainer for that horse and the horse that was not persevered with. Uh, so this is the kind of thing that, you know, it's, it, you can't, I, I can't get up here and say that they fixed the race. But it is one of those things that happens every now and then in racing where there's an alleged betting coup. And, you know, I think Gulfstream, again, is, is doing a really good job being proactive about this kind of stuff and really rooting it out. Um, so I so I appreciate them, you know, stepping stepping up and, and really, uh, you know, kind of having a no nonsense policy for a lot of things that people have just kind of taken for granted that happen on the racetrack over the years. Uh, but I know Bill has a lot of thoughts on this. Yeah, I mean, Joe, you're right. I and mean, we haven't seen this in a long time. We don't see this much anymore. This was an old fashioned betting coup. And the horse that won, the trainer is, I'll, I'm going to butcher this name, Juan Reviengo. And the horse that won was a, their main 12 5. In his prior start, he had been 6 by 16th. And the start before that, 7 by 15. By the way, with Lugo aboard in those previous starts, somehow they knew. I don't know what happened in those starts, but 
you know, they knew this horse was going to run his eyeballs out and likely win this race. And, you know, somebody probably involved with the connections, the owner, the trainer, et cetera, apparently bet a tremendous amount of money on that. So, you know, that's bad enough as it is that, you know, there's some sort of shenanigans being played out of that. We don't really know. But you watch the replay and then the stable mate, they obviously, if in fact there was a betting coup, they obviously don't want the stable mate to upset the other horse and ruin all their bets because they did bet. They bet win place and show. According, if, if the pool, if the amount of money that was in the pools that escalated the pools was because of the quote unquote betting coup, they bet win, they bet exactas, they bet trifectas. And lo and behold, their horse, the other horse ran fourth. So, you know, they didn't want to blow up you know, winning all this money on this horse. Now, I, I have kind of mixed feelings about this. Yes, Gulfstream deserves credit because you know what? A lot of racetracks would have done nothing, absolutely nothing about this. Just look the other way. Who cares? I'm glad they suspended this guy for 30 days. But at the same time, I don't think that's enough. I, I mean, if in fact they feel this is what happened, that a guy stiffed a horse to set up a betting coup, to me, that's really serious and kind of, you know, it's almost in the service Navarro type thing where, you know, you're cheating to win money and to, to win races and you're defrauding the, the public. I mean, the, the, whoever bet on this horse had finished fourth, if in fact the horse was held by the jockey, was defrauded out of money in here. Uh, maybe, you know, I, I know one of the stories said they're still looking into it. I'd like to see this jockey get at least a year in here. I, I don't think 30 days is nearly enough. Well, and how about the trainer too? Like, oh, yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it shouldn't just stop at the jockey getting 30 days. I agree with you. But yeah, this is the kind of thing that, you know, in the grand scheme of things, nobody cares about a 12 5 maiden claim or golf stream on a Thursday or a Saturday or whatever it was. But this is the kind of thing that gives the betting public license to be suspicious about any kind of, you know, anomalies or any kind of, you know, uh, I guess, extraordinary betting patterns. And I think there is a lot of that. If you go on racing Twitter, there's a lot of accusations thrown around about people who are, you know, stiff and horses, jockey stiff and horses, even at the top levels, even at the Naira tracks, there's a lot of people who think that, you know, for example, that Irad and Jose are in cahoots and they, they fix races. Which now. isn't true, by the no, way. No, no, no. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm not, I d definitely don't believe that to be the case. So it's, it's kind of a, a, of a ridiculous uh, allegation. But nevertheless, what I'm saying is that these kind of things, even if they're in smaller races, smaller tracks, give people reason to be suspicious, even in cases where there isn't anything suspicious going on. And it happens. Listen, it happens. All the, they knew they knew is a is a is a, a term in racing that. I, I've used plenty when a horse, you know, that I think should be bet down to a certain uh, number is way above that and doesn't run a step or a horse that you would think would be way longer on paper is bet crazy down and then runs off to a, to a big win. You kind of just feel like everybody else knew what was going to happen in the race other than you. And most of the time, most of the time, that's probably not the case. Most of the time, it's probably just bad handicapping or bad luck or whatever. But there are, you know, there are enough instances like that where I think it leads people to, to be suspicious when the betting patterns don't make any sense. So I agree with Bill that you know, I think this thing, you know, good on Gulfstream for doing something about it. But I think overall, these, this thing should should be kind of these people should be persona non grata at, at the tracks that if they can prove that this is what happened, I, I you know, I don't I don't see any reason to leave it. at just suspending a 5 percent jockey for 30 days, because who cares? You know, if they really did do this betting coup, they'll pay for his you know next 30 days amounts or whatever. And he'll just be back on the track. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting scenario. And, you know, I think this is also the kind of thing that happened a lot back in the day, you know, when there when there wasn't some simulcasting and there wasn't there weren't eyes on every single race i think that this happened a lot more now i, th I think it's pretty rare but it's interesting to see that it, that it still does happen and i think it's obviously something that tracks should have no tolerance for just wanted a couple I'll touch on a couple other news stories uh before we get out of here you know th there, there have been a lot of change of plea agreements that we've touched on um with the service and navarro with the fbi indictments we have potentially the ninth change of plea to guilty going on uh right now 
with a guy who was a who's a you know kind of disgraced har- harness trainer named Christopher Oaks. Uh, he's facing two felony charges um, in the alleged nationwide horse doping conspiracy case. Could be the ninth among 28 initially indicted defendants to flip his plea to guilty after having requested and been granted a plea change hearing that on Tuesday got set for October 20th. I'm reading from from TD Thornton's story in the in the TDN today about it. The only reason that he's kind of interesting is. One of the horses that Oaks and Navarro allegedly conspired to dope was XY Jet. And XY Jet was kind of the, you know, the 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 mascot for lack of a better term for how corrupt and how disgusting this scheme was with as the XY Jet was was the, the well-known horse that really, you know, paid the price, paid the consequences for these guys allegedly doping up horses. And it, it, you know, it's disgusting. You can go through and read the quotes and all the stuff that they were, you know, saying that they were going to give him and, and, you know, how much of this should I buy and how much of this should I use? And it's just obviously no regard for the horse's wealth, health or safety whatsoever. So it's obviously a very disgusting thing, but just every one of these change of plea agreements that comes in, I think the noose gets a little, little bit tighter on Jason's service. And I just, I'm waiting, I'm counting down the days to when that Jason service thing goes to trial, if it does, because it, it just seems, like I said before, when these guys started flipping, that they're going to try to make him into the ringleader. Um, and then later on this year, I, I believe it's in December, is uh, Jorge Navarro's official uh, sentencing. So that's going to be interesting to see how much time he gets and what we can read from that in terms of you know wh- what kind of information he gave uh, to the government in this case. Uh, so th- there's a, that's an update on that. And then also, um, we, we you know, we talked about this last week when I was at, at the courthouse when Bob Baffert's uh, contempt claim got dismissed by the judge, uh, basically allowed the the hearing process that Naira set up to go forward. Um, they had the, the pre-hearing conference uh, yesterday and they selected a January 24th, 2022 start date for the official hearing process to determine whether Naira can exclude Bob Baffert from racing at its tracks. Then the two parties mutually agreed on that date. So at least now we're getting a little bit of movement on this thing. The only thing is January 2022 is just the beginning of what's going to be a lengthy process, you know, where the hearing officer then has to make recommendations to a board. The board has to deliberate. You know, Bob Baffert's going to have a lot of time to, to give his side of the story before any of that happens. So I just wonder if this is kind of going to fall out of the news a little bit in terms of the Medina spirit thing and the, the, the pitchforks being out for Bob Abbott, I think justifiably so in a lot of cases. So I think that this is going to drag on well into next year. And I just wonder if the public appetite for a, a long suspension for Bob Baffert is necessarily going to be the same as it was when Naira first put out that release, which was all the way back on May 17th of this year, saying that they were suspending Bob Baffert because of the Medina spirit over it. But I guess we'll see what happens. You know, we'll, we'll see what Naira eventually comes up with and you know whether or not Bob Baffert has any, any compelling counter arguments. Um, but at least at least the wheels are moving now a little bit because God knows I am sick of the back and forth in court with this thing. It's just, it's just so typical of, of racing and I guess legal, you know, process processes in general, but it's just, it's been going on forever and there's just, there's been really nothing, no meat on the bone until last week when the judge dismissed that contempt claim. So January 24th is the day when the hearing process officially starts. And we'll, I, I promise no more updates until that happens, until that starts. We'll steer clear of the Bob Baffert versus Ny- Naira melodrama, but yeah, that's good, luck, good luck with that. <laughs> I, well, yeah, I, I, yeah, they mutually agreed on this date, so I don't okay. know. What, I don't know. We'll see. Maybe they'll be That's until back. a new motion to file an old motion to appeal the motion that uh, you know. <laughs> Call me an optimist, Bill, but I okay. think that let the process play out this time. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, that's the date to look forward to, and then we'll keep an eye on that. Joining a West Point Thoroughbreds partnership can vault you into the world of instant camaraderie among people surrounding high-class horses against six winners over the weekend and stakes action for a fraction of the cost trying to do it on your own. Learn more at westpointtb.com. We'll be right back after this message from West Point Thoroughbreds. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. 
So we have a bunch of new names. We have, we have a bunch of new submissions for our Lane's End slash Honor Code Name the, name the Cult contest. Uh, so thank you everyone who keeps uh, sending the names in. We're, we're very excited to have that kind of feedback and to have that kind of participation. Ton of great names. So it's honestly really, really hard to pick. Uh, I don't want to admit how much time I, I spent, you know, pouring over the names to figure out which one I was going to pick for this week. Uh, but if we can put up the, the, the finalists from last week, we're going to add three more this week again the, the deal is i pick one bill picks one john picks one each week for three weeks then patty our producer gets the 10th name we're gonna you know go in a room and, and go in the, the 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 conclave and with those 10 names and, and figure out who's gonna win in the end uh so th- this week my pick was guest of the week from skip anderson skip again i did not know this was skip's name but two weeks in a row that i've chosen skip's name and then shout out to my boy skip i guess we're just we're like that you know naturally and as our our owner writer as anthony said skip please save some honor code hats for everybody else uh but we do have two other different people for bill and john's picks two names that I also really like as well. And I, I took a look at uh, moral imperative was Bill's pick uh, from Leah Whitesell. So shout out to, to Leah. And I think that that kind of really jibes with the, the vibe of, of this show as well. It's all about the moral imperatives to take care of the sport. So that's Bill's pick. Um, and then John's pick this week was cheat code uh, from Alicia McQuilkin Russell. So shout out to Alicia for, for sending that in as well. Um, so guest of the week, moral imperative and cheat code are the three finalists for this week. We got one more week. We're each going to pick one more next week. And then Patty's going to throw hers in and we're going to pick the winner. And as long as it gets by the jockey club, you have to have to have that caveat. Your horse name will be seen on the track next year. Again, it's honor code Colt out of Nikki new. If you're watching for the first time, we're still taking submissions. You can send them to Sue Finley at the TDN.com. So we're going to keep taking submissions up until the end of the contest. And then we might, who knows, you could send it in the day before the contest ends and we might end up picking your name. So thanks again to everybody for the participation. And thanks again to Lane's end and honor code for sponsoring it. And we'll be right back after this message from Lane's end and honor code. Honor code. A multiple grade one winner from the final crop of the legendary AP Indy. Never off the board in 11 starts, he was crowned champion older horse before retiring. Now he's living up to the promise of his pedigree with progeny like grade one winner Honor AP, grade three winner Max Player, and multiple six figure yearling sales. Honor Code stands to continue his sire's legacy at Lane's End. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. With over 500 clients in the horse business, they have proven strategies to save you taxes. Learn more about how they can help you at www.greenco.com. So we are thrilled to bring on this week the face of NBC, Naira, one of the best racing sports broadcasters, I think, honestly. Lafitte Pinkai, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, Very kind. I appreciate it. Great to be here with you guys. Yeah, it's great to have you. Like I said, you do a great job on the on the Naira broadcast in particular. And we've talked about this a lot on the show, how important that broadcast was last year when we had the COVID shutdown. There weren't any other sports really going on. You had the spotlight all to yourself. And I think it really helped to bring some new eyes to the sport. I wonder if you've experienced that at all, if you've had any fans come up to you or talk to you, or if you've just heard anything that suggests that you brought some some new people into the sport. I think the interaction with the fans at Saratoga um, was the is the first thing that comes to mind. Um, I can't tell you how many people we saw, first of all, having the fans back at Saratoga and that while we were going through through such a trying time, obviously, during the course of the pandemic and the anxiety that comes with that, with no other sports really going on. I know baseball eventually started in the summer, but how many people told us that that was their escape on a day-to-day basis to just check out where you didn't have to watch the news and worry about everything for those few hours during the course of an afternoon and what a difference that made to them and and how special that was for us uh, to hear that, that we were able to provide racing and the fact that racing was able to continue this massive ecosystem. If ever there was a sport designed to thrive during the course of a pandemic, it was horse racing where you don't have a lot of human to human contact, how many years we have operated, you know, without the stands necessarily, being being packed so uh, yeah just that that feedback alone and and for us how fortunate we were to be distracted and to be able to do our job and i can't tell you how many people i know 
in the media, in sports media specifically, that weren't able to work or that were laid off or lost jobs, adding more anxiety to an already anxious situation. Hey, Lafitte, thanks for joining us. And of course, now we're getting down to the nitty gritty for the Breeders' Cup. Uh, earlier in this podcast, we had a group discussion of whether or not Petruska should run the classic or just, I was in the minority. I said they should go for it. Uh, go for it. Uh, low, you only live once, et cetera. Go in the Breeders' Cup Classic. Uh, Joe and John Green, who was on at that time, shot me down and made some pretty good arguments as well. Where do you stand on this? We love three different types of scenarios in thoroughbred racing. When it comes to a racehorse and a style, the come and catch me if you can front runner, the Silky Sullivan type of closer, those horses get us up out of our seats. And we love the story of the girls taking on the boys. You know, some of our most vivid memories in the Breeders' Cup, certain moments that come to mind, you know, Goldacova beating the boys in the three Breeders' Cup miles and Yada winning a Breeders' Cup classic. From a story perspective, absolutely, I would love to see it. But that's just the, the fan in me. But, but if I'm calling the shots and you look at how the race is shaping up, just from an X's and O's pace, O's pace standpoint, with Nick's go and some of these other really fast males out there, I, I don't, it, it, maybe if the race shape was more to her liking in terms of where she's most effective, but with that type of speed that you've seen on paper, having to look Nick's go eyeball to eyeball, I think strategically, I think it's probably the right call because maybe the race shape isn't in her favor. Again, as a racing fan, of course, I would love to see it, but that doesn't make it the right call. Yeah, I mean, that's that's the argument I was making. They want to win horse of the year. And this classic with that much speed, I just think she's it's a recipe for her to run up the track. And maybe people maybe well, let's say she yeah. let, let, so I, I, I apologize for, for interrupting. No, go ahead. Let, if, let's say she goes wire to wire in the distaff and maybe an essential quality gets beat in the classic. And we'll see about next go. I, I think the door is still open for a potential horse of the year if she wins in the distaff and one of the bigger names doesn't happen to win the classic. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that, that was my point as well. The, the recipe is that she'll run up the track in, in the classic, I think, particularly this year. You know, I wanted, I wanted to ask a little bit about your upbringing. I think now you're the most famous Lafitte Pinkai. I think for a while there, it was neck and neck between you and your dad, but I think now you've overtaken him. But I wonder about your upbringing and whether or not you always wanted to be in racing. I, it's, I hear a lot of people who are sons of jockeys say they wanted to be a jockey until they got too tall. I wonder if that was maybe the case with you, but also whether or not you always wanted to be in the sport if you had some other avenues you were considering and then eventually went into broadcasting, when did you know that you wanted to be in racing full time? We, we are recording this, right? Like, like I have yeah. to send that clip to my father. My, my, father, <laughs> my father has to, has to see that. You know, racetracks weren't quite as fan fr family friendly as they are now when I was growing up. We didn't grow up my sister and I at, at the racetrack, it was more for, it was, it was adults, you know, it was gambling and drinking and doing whatever the hell else at the racetrack, having a great time. But the kids kind of stayed home um, where it's a little bit different now. So I didn't grow up really following it all that closely. I was a huge baseball, football, basketball fan. I always knew I wanted to be involved in sports in some capacity. Riding was like never an option. Like I was wearing my dad's suits to the track when I would go on rare occasion when I was like 12 or 13. <laughs> dad's dad's 5'1". I'm a little bit taller, a little bit heavier. Um, even if I wanted to ride, he wouldn't have allowed it. He's like, if you do it, you'd better be really good because it's a really difficult life. People think that because you win a million dollar race, hey, the jockey made a million dollars. No, it's 60% of the purse and then 10% of that. And then a quarter goes to your agent. It's not quite what it's made out to be in that regard. Um, the way he had to starve himself, no off season. Um, you know, it wasn't necessarily something, even if I wanted to do, even if I was built to be a jockey that he would have allowed. Um, it wasn't until my teenage years that I kind of took an interest and that was just, you know, father and son figuring out a way to bond. And for us, it was me taking somewhat of an interest in his business. I found, you know, just cabinets full of VHS tapes of, big races that he had won. And I watched those over and over and over. And then I found his beta collection, had those transferred to VHS and watched those as well. So I kind of taught myself in that regard, the history uh, of the sport. And when it came time to decide what I wanted to do for a living, as much as I love sports, I wasn't going to be an athlete. Um, television seemed like the right, like the right avenue. And initially I did want to do baseball, basketball, football. My first job was at News 12 in the Bronx. That had nothing to do with horse racing. It was all smaller, you know, high school sports and occasionally covering the, the Yankees, that kind of thing. 
kind of fell into the horse racing thing, just looking for a job when I got back from New York and it, it kind of went on from there. News 12. We, I'm in Brooklyn. So well, they, 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 well, yeah, they do a good job. They do a really they, good job. Yeah. Yeah. It was, <laughs> listen, it was, they wanted young, inexperienced, cheap and willing to do anything. Like we drove ourselves. We carried the tripod. We shot, you know, all of our own stuff. We edited. It was like an absolute one man band. But without that experience for those couple of years in the late nineties in New York, um, yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not doing this. Uh, Lafitte, let's stay on the subject of your father, who's on the Mount Rushmore of all time. John, he's no doubt about it. And we're talking Breeders' Cup. He wins seven Breeders' Cup races in his career. A uh, couple with Bayako and the Disc Staff. He wins this with Skywalker in the Classic. Do you have a favorite memory of him winning the Breeders' Cup? And if he were on, if we were to ask him, what was his greatest memory of the Breeders' Cup? What do you think that would be? I would guess the Classic with Skywalker in 86. Um, the, the owner, uh, Tom Tatham of Oak Cliff Stables, uh, his son, Casey is still one of my closest friends. Uh, I was not there. I, for some reason was at my school's homecoming game, but I, I was in fifth grade. I think it was, I think my father would say that day. Cause he won two races. He also won on Capote. He went wire to wire in the juvenile for Lucas and then Skywalker. And because it was a little bit unexpected, you, you had Turco man, you had precisionist. It was supposed to be a two horse race. Herat, that little 15 hand horse that you could stuff in your pocket was always a thorn in the side of precisionist. Turco man fell so far back. And uh, I thought, you know, objectively speaking, my father did administer a beautiful ride on Skywalker, um, blowing that race open around the far turn. And that was his only win in a Breeders' Cup Classic. I think that's the one he would probably say. Um, for me, it would be his, his last, only because that was the only one I was there for with phone chatter in the 93 juvenile Phillies and watching him and Eddie De La Husse, you know, duel from the quarter pole to the wire. Eddie D was on Sardula, uh, my dad on, on phone chatter. And phone chatter was big, 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 massive two-year-old filly. She, she looked like a three-year-old, four-year-old colt. And um, being the, actually being there, and it was such a close, exciting race to celebrate that with him, for me, no question, that's my favorite Breeders' Cup memory. Not to keep living in the past, but I just, you know, I want to I want to hold on to that. You know, you grew up early, I think, in, in racing's heyday, and it's lost a lot of ground over the time in terms of market share. Um, I wonder if you have any thoughts about, you know, why that may be. Is it just a natural thing that some sports get less popular over time? Is there things that racing has done wrong specifically that has kind of lost its ground? And is there, are there things that you think racing can do now to regain some, a little bit of that. I, like I said, last year, I think that you guys did a yeoman's work in that regard, but there's more work to be done. What are your feelings on that? I think we learned that the interest in general, uh, for example, uh, through the wagering that took place on Naira's platform, um, the observation being that most of those signups during that time of the pandemic when nothing else was happening, that most of those new members would cancel once sports came back and that would be the end of it. They estimated, I believe, 80% of those new cancellations would go away. Uh, as to 80% of the new signups would eventually cancel. And in fact, 80% of the signups were still firing well after the fact. I think that that 10-year deal announced with Fox, I don't know that that happens without the pandemic, just from the observation of how interested people still were in racing given the opportunity. Guys, I think it's just a matter of there being so much else. You know, the, you know, fantasy sports is such a monster now, and you didn't have that to contend with. Every Sunday is like a damn a holiday now with the interest in, in fantasy. Um, with, uh, I think they're just being more distraction, and I think there's being more options out there. Um, and the idea that 90% of the wagering that comes in on horse racing is done off track, that most of us, for me, it's a little bit different being that my father was that – intimately involved in the sport, but for so many fans that were introduced to the sport by going with grandpa, with going with mom and dad and experiencing it for themselves and kind of, it gets in your blood and it is, it really, it's, it's, it becomes one of your favorite sports, like a football, baseball, basketball, horse racing. So I've been doing it with my father and my mother. I've been going on this particular day every day since I was a little kid. I think that that might have one reason or at least one element um, to the formula in terms of why racing might not be as popular as it once was. There aren't as many firsthand experiences taking place of people growing up, going with their family to the track because so much of it is done uh, from from home. 
It's sort of staying on the same subject, I was doing a little homework for this, Lafitte, and uh, I was reading something, I think you did a, an interview with America's Best Racing, and you said something that I know Joe and I would definitely agree on, that there's too much racing. But you also took it a step further, and you said, why should horse racing be like baseball, football, basketball, hockey, and actually have an off-season? And how that would really re-energize people and get their batteries charged. Um, I don't know if that's practical or not, but it's an interesting idea. Tell us more. I think you have to, you can have too much of a good thing. And you have to give people the opportunity to, to, to miss you, to, to miss a sport. The first, second Sunday in, in September, like I talk about the Sundays being holidays with the, with the popularity of football. It, that opening weekend, it, it's it's special. We've we've missed it. We haven't had a chance to see real football since since February. Here in in California, even when racing would end, um, you know, in in April, maybe a week or two after the Santa Anita Derby, by the time it would return just for the Oak Tree Meet in the fall, it, it would feel special because you really would have missed it. And then when it would come back for Opening Day Santa Anita, now that you have without Hollywood Park. It, it gets to feel uh, it's a little monotonous. There's something going year round. You need you need change. It gets a little Groundhog Day ish. You can change the name of the stakes races all you want, but essentially you're seeing the same thing over and over and over again. Um, if you had a chance to give, you know, if the horses had a little bit more chance before there was all this winter racing, they would be turned out and they'd go stand in the snow for a couple of months and give them a chance to just be horses and give them a chance to to heal up. Uh, jockeys as well. That's an, that that burnout. Um, I think everyone would benefit from a little bit of time off. If you had year-round baseball or any of these other sports going, you'd get a little bit tired of it. And, and I'll give an example. I live in California. The beach is right there. I don't go to the beach that often. But if you told me that the beach was going to be gone in 30 days, you know, I'd probably go a few times before it was gone because you always know it's there. You kind of take it for granted. I think most of us as racing fans, I do think we take it for granted that it's always there there's too much of it which is why the boutique meets seem to do so much better in terms of handle and popularity yeah i mean i think that's definitely true I, I, there really is that dichotomy between how well saratoga and kentucky downs and these tracks do and then how some of the lower level tracks lose handle uh year over year I, uh, one other question i had for you you know i wonder if your perspective has changed a little bit from broadcasting from being in front of the camera and and yeah uh, you get to work with guys who are good handicappers you get to work with people who are really good at you know you know analyzing horse flesh in the paddock have you have you found that you have a more well-rounded view of the sport now that you've been able to to be in front of the camera and be around those kind of people there's so much you learn through just the osmosis being there and, and the guys that you learn from. You know, I learned the handicapping aspect from uh, a Jeff Siegel sitting next to him for hours a day for all the years we worked together at HRTV. Um, you know, the, the number crunching with with Randy Moss watching races unfold. And I got a chance to do this with my father as well, but doing so during a live broadcast with a Jerry Bailey um, in New York. Uh, Maggie and Acacia give you something that you can't get anywhere else. There's so much information out there, but from what they see in the paddock, you can't get there anywhere else. And when you start looking for stuff that they start looking for, sure, that adds to your own repertoire as well. Being able to judge horse flesh, which I'm far from an expert from, it's amazing how they can pick certain things up that it's not, that doesn't come as, as, as naturally. Um, sitting next to an, an, an Andy Serling and, and his, the number crunching as well and the day to day handicapping. You know, a uh, uh, Tom Amos, and even though he's a great trainer, he's also a tremendous handicapper. People forget Bobby Frankel was a handicapper before he was a great trainer. So these, you know, uh, uh, Richard Migliori, his understanding of the history of New York racing, and and a guy that's that's had so much experience in New York. Barry Stevens, a big race experience. Being a, having a chance to work with that many different personalities that come from different backgrounds and have different levels of expertise. Yeah. I think it makes your overall knowledge that much more well-rounded as opposed to spending every day, every show, every broadcast with the same analyst. Absolutely. If you know, I would imagine uh, preparing as you have to do for the breeders cup, which I'm sure you're going to be doing an awful lot of over these next few weeks must be a, a monumental task. You, what is, I, I'm correct me if the numbers are, I think there's 14 races, well over 100 horses. Tell us what your next three or four weeks are going to be like and what you have to do to be able to not just be your best on that broadcast, but to be on top of, you know, dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of you know pieces of information about these horses. 
I'm a preparation freak in that uh, this is my personality. I don't feel comfortable unless for me, the litmus test is if I bump into somebody at the airport who happens to be affiliated with a certain race horse coming up in a certain race, can I have a conversation with that person as if the horse was my own without looking at the past performances, without looking at, you know, the racing form or anything else. Am I familiar enough with that particular racehorse where I can have that educated conversation with somebody connected to the horse with the breeders cup? It's impossible. Like I, I start, I, I get very uncomfortable when pre-entries come out. I'm like, who the hell is this? <laughs> and it happens every single year. There's over 200 horses that are entered. And now that we do have the 14 different races, um, that's really the biggest challenge. And, and you know, you, you kind of go into a, a basement. If I'm not watching baseball playoffs, you're, you're doing the deep dive researching and trying to become as familiar as you possibly can with the major contenders and are the are articles that have been written. There's so much great content that's provided shows like this one um, that you have to keep current with. And that's probably the biggest challenge, especially while you get closer to game day is that then you start going over the actual rundown for the show. It's like, okay, we're here time to get ready for the show, but there's still so much content being generated and it's impossible to stay current. There's always sort of that insecurity that a horse crosses the wire and you're not familiar with that story and what makes that win special. And you see something about this has happened. You see something about it after the fact on social media, like, Oh my God, I missed that story. Um, just something you happen to miss. Something's going to fall through the cracks because you're dealing with so many. That That is the, easily the biggest challenge of, of the Breeders' Cup. So many races, so many horses, so many storylines. So let's just spin that forward and then we'll let you get out of here. You've been very generous with your time. What are some of the other storylines? We talked about with Truska, but what are some of the other storylines or other horses that you're particularly interested in seeing at the Breeders' Cup? I'm a just a sucker for Jackie's Warrior. Um, I think it's interesting that at this time last year, he was considered probably the likeliest winner going into any of the Breeders' Cup races. I believe he was installed as the shortest price of any, the heaviest favorite going in, albeit it didn't work out in the juvenile. Um, there's so much talent, class, grit and determination there. I'm just a huge, huge fan. I can't, I can't wait to see him. Um, a little disappointed that it looks like the Philly Mare Sprint's coming up a little bit light in terms of competition for Gamine. Um, storylines that we follow with Europeans. There were six grass races at Del Mar. There are six grass races in the Breeders' Cup, I believe. Uh, at Del Mar, there were three winners uh, that came over from Europe and won back in 2017. There used to be this notion um, going back to horses like Dancing Brave and Zilzal, who disappointed his heavy favorites in the early days of the Breeders' Cup. And it was, it's too warm in California for the Europeans to thrive. The ground's too hard. The turns are too tight. And once 2003 came around and the mountains were on fire and it was 100 degrees and we're at Santa Anita and a rock hard you know, surface and the Europeans swept the grass races, including the dead heat with Johar and high chaparral, you learn very quickly, maybe just lean towards talent. And that's what's going to prevail in the Breeders' Cup. Uh, last time we were at Del Mar, it was heavy favorite after heavy favorite disappointing. I think that's kind of a theme to follow. Was that just a you know funky outlier in that year's Breeders' Cup? Um, you know, do you lead, do you, do you dig a little bit deeper, reach a little bit more for some of the long shots? Um, we'll see how it all, how it all comes together. Um, we're still, we get pre amazing. We get pre-entries, uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, and of course is always the, the classic and, and seeing with, with a horse like a Nick's go, who I'm also a big fan of his, his speed and the talent is there, but the idea of whether or not he can run that far and how much praise pressure he's going to be facing. Those are just some of the first, first storylines that come to mind. Lafitte, man, we can't thank you so much. We can't thank you enough for the time. We really enjoy talking to you. We'd love to have you back on sometime. Best of luck to your Dodgers and best of luck at the Breeders' Cup, man. Good to talk to you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you, Lafitte. Anytime, guys. Thanks, Bill. Anytime, guys. Thank you very much. Right. Well, thanks, Lafitte. The Green Group Guest of the Week is sponsored by The Green Group, an accounting, tax, consulting, and advisory firm specializing in the thoroughbred industry. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, Lafitte Pinkai, will receive a free one-hour tax consultation. Learn more at greenco.com. We'll be right back after this message from The Green Group. 
Why do the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisor? We simply save them money and know how to make them more successful. Over the past 40 years, founder Leonard Green has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport. His in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. All right, so that's going to do it for this week's edition of the TDN Writers Room, presented by Keeneland. A reminder that the Keeneland Fall Meet is still going through October 30th. Ton of great action over the weekend. Lots of great action still to come this week. And also the Keeneland November Sale catalog is now online. You can view that at Keeneland.com. I want to thank Bill Finley, John Green. So great to have you back, man. Hopefully we can get them for the full show next week. Our Green Group guest of the week, Lafitte Lef- 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 Pinkai, our producer, Patty Wolf, our associate producer, Katie Petruniak, and our editor is Anthony. Anthony LaRocca, Aliyah LaRocca, Nathan Wilkinson. Thank you all so much for watching. Keep sending in those names to suefinley at the TDN.com. We'll see you next week. 